Hello there, my fellow Elector Counts, and welcome back to some Warhammer Fantasy lore. Today we're gonna be tackling another very important character in the history of the Empire. In fact, I'm even a bit ashamed that it took me this long to make a video on this guy. For he is arguably one of the top three most important characters in the Empire's history, and definitely one of the most beloved. Ladies and gentlemen, none other than Magnus the Pious. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and I humbly bring to you a story about his life and achievements. Magnus the Pious, born Magnus von Bildhofen, who ruled as Magnus I, was an emperor who reigned between 2304 and 2369 IC. In his lifetime, he was a famous general and a war hero, who led the people of the Empire against the forces of chaos. Following his great victory, Magnus was crowned emperor, the first one to properly unite the empire in several centuries, and he chose Nuln as the capital. Even two centuries later, Magnus is venerated as the second greatest hero of the empire, outside of Sigmar of course. But let us start at the beginning. Magnus was born to the Bildhoven family in Nuln after the turn of the 23rd century. This was in the aftermath of the Age of the Free Emperors, a civil war which had bled the empire dry for centuries, leaving the nation leaderless and divided. He grew up as a young nobleman with a fanatical devotion to the Church of Sigmar and the Empire, and such was his dedication that his family sent him to university in Nuln to try to disperse his energy. However, that would not happen, as he would gain a following of students who gathered to hear his rousing speeches. Magnus realized that the lack of leadership in the Empire left them unable to defend themselves against the growing threat of chaos. Meanwhile, far to the north, the Chaos Gods were grooming once more a champion to conquer the world. The Wastes swept beyond their borders to engulf the Troll Country. Rumors abounded about a monstrous Chaos Host readying to invade as portents grew more dire. To the men of the old world, it seemed as the end times were finally upon them. No, not those end times, fortunately. In Nuln, the Magi, a powerful cult of change, was leading an uprising, unleashing literal demons on the city streets. Those that remained loyal to Sigmar prayed for deliverance, receiving an answer as the twin-tailed comet, the symbol of the god, blazed in the night sky. Inspired by the comet, Magnus rallied the people, and under his leadership, chaos was purged from the city. Then he took that crusade across the entire empire. An army began to assemble as the electors lent their strength to Magnus's cause. The general was soon leading the greatest army ever assembled in the empire. Eventually, he reached Middenheim, where he sought an audience with our Ulrich Kristov. After Kristoff denounced Magnus as a liar and a charlatan, Magnus walked in the flame of Ulrich unscathed, proving the righteousness of his cause and the favor of the god. Then, tactfully, he appointed Kristoff as the leader of the cavalry force, and Ulrich and Sigmarite turned to face the common enemy together. Just as the Empire finished uniting behind Magnus, a message came from Tsar Alexis Romanov of Kislev. It told of a crushing defeat inflicted upon his armies, leaving Kislev cities open to attack. Magnus heeded the news and set out for the north, intending to take the fight to the enemy. And as the new year began, the imperial forces thundered towards Kislev. In the city of Dalapheim, Magnus met with Peter Laszlo, who was accompanied by three distinguished high elves. They were led by the mighty Teclis and two of his comrades, Finreir and Yertel. Although Magnus had a strong faith in Sigmar, he knew that his men were not invulnerable. Although he didn't doubt that the Empire's troops could defeat any mortal enemy, the demons of Chaos were another matter entirely. Magnus knew that the armies of Chaos had one grave advantage over his, and that advantage was magic users. In the Empire, at least at the time, anyone who dabbled in magic was seen as a pawn of Chaos. So, with the help of the High Elves, humans could then be trained to wield the winds of magic without corruption. Magnus would declare an immediate amnesty for all magic users, if they agreed to join his cause and serve under the eye of the High Elves. 
Teclis and his brothers used their magical arts to assemble those that could be taught, and trained the very first of the Imperial Wizards. Unfortunately, despite the speed of Magnus's cavalry force, they failed to reach Kislev in time to stop the fall of Prague. As the Dark Gods were triumphing, the raw power of chaos was coursing in the streets, melting stone and flesh together like wax. People were merged with the stone itself, buildings turned into monsters. Prague became a nightmare incarnate, and only a taste of what awaited the entire world if chaos won over all. When news of the defeated reached Magnus, he wept and vowed before Sigmar to avenge the horrors done that day. During the campaign which followed, in a carefully prepared ambush, the cavalry destroyed the Chaos rearguard, leaving Asavar Kul, the Chaos leader, entirely oblivious to what was going on. The horde of Kul continued towards the city of Kislev, laying siege as Magnus's wearied army arrived as well. The time had come for the two forces to face each other. The brave humans and their dwarf allies from Karaza Karak, who joined them not long after the fall of Prague, were still vastly outnumbered though. As the battle preparations were going on, Magnus would stand before his troops and say, and I quote, I can see in your eyes that you fear this enemy. I can see in your eyes that you wonder how we can fight such terrible monsters. Men of the Empire, I have the answer. We fight them with our steel, we fight them with our courage, but above all, we fight them with our faith in Sigmar. Magnus planned the attack with the High King Alrikson of the Dwarves. In a pincer movement, Magnus would attack Kul's western flank, while the Dwarves charged into the Horde's southern flank. Freed from the siege, the Kislevites would break out too and join their friends. Having agreed to the strategy, the Allied armies deployed. And so, at the break of dawn, Magnus charged the Chaos Army, slaughtering and routing thousands of the tainted foe. As Kul noticed the forces attacking him, he divided his own army, personally leading a force to contain Magnus. The Imperial Army's momentum stalled, and they were driven back on the defensive. Fearing that their saviors would be destroyed before their eyes, hundreds of dwarves attempted to break out and aid Magnus. Although the dwarves were incredibly courageous and claimed many enemies, the army surrounding Kislev was simply too big, and the dwarves too were driven back with heavy losses. Asavarkul ordered his shock troops into position, intent on crushing Kislev for all time. Defeat was seemingly inevitable. But it was then that the Imperial Cavalry Force arrived. Seeing their last chance to turn the tide, the human force plunged into the horde with a ferocity born of hatred. In moments, the northern flank of the Chaos Army had been crushed, bowing to the Imperial's implacable anger. As panic was spreading in the enemy horde, Magnus ordered his own men to charge one final time. Caught between the hammer and anvil of the Imperials, the horde collapsed into anarchy. As Magnus took stock of the situation, a voice warned him of a beast in human form approaching, and this was the enemy leader Asavar Kul. The Ever Chosen immediately challenged the Champion of Sigmar to single combat, as a test of might between their gods. After a brutal duel, Magnus eventually won, beheading Asavar Kul. At the same time, the Kislevites and the Dwarves broke through and charged the Chaos Army too. Finally caught on three fronts, the Chaos Horde was destroyed, saving the Old World from being enthralled to Chaos. The Allied armies would then turn to liberate the city of Erengrad and level the tainted city of Prague. On the return to the Empire, they also destroyed the city of Mordheim, freeing the province of Ostland and the Ostermark from beastmen. At last, chaos had been driven back from all the lands of men. And so, on quite a happy note, in 2304 Magnus saw his dream of unity realized and was elected Emperor of the Empire of Man by acclamation of both the Elector Counts and the citizens of the Empire. At Magnus' request, the High Elf Mage Teclis founded the Eight Colleges of Magic in Aldorf, so that men could finally begin to grasp in a more comprehensive way the power of the Winds of Magic. As the wizards established themselves in Aldorf, Magnus chose his capital to be Null instead. During the reign of Magnus, the infrastructure of the Empire was rebuilt and improved, corruption was rooted out, and ties with other lands renewed. 
At the urging of the Shalian sisters, the prisons of the empire were reformed. In fact, Grand Fiogonist Volkmar's reign, much later, was said to be heavily influenced by Magnus's deeds, teachings, and sermons. The popularity of Magnus was absolute after his ascension to the imperial throne, and quite impossible to relate in the written word by his chroniclers. He had defeated an incredibly powerful foe, and personally slain their champion, Asavar Kul. Moreover, he had united the empire in a manner more thorough than anyone save Sigmar. Some even believe that Magnus was Sigmar reborn, and Sigmarite chroniclers of the time feature many accounts of miracles that the hero supposedly performed, all supporting that claim. Many more believe that Magnus was certainly Sigmar's heir, if not Sigmar himself. At the end of the day, however, no matter what they believed, almost all believed that he had to be crowned emperor. And so, for the first time in a thousand years, the leaders of all the great provinces gathered in one place to elect an emperor, and it was Magnus that they chose. Of course, not all the nobles liked it, but they had little choice. They would have been lynched by everyone else if they refused Magnus. He was loved like no one else, and this was something Emperor Magnus of Nuln used to great effect when he implemented his reforms. In memory of the cult of Sigmar's unflagging support of the electoral emperors, Magnus granted that cult free votes on the electoral council. However, in recognition of the cult of Ulrich's unique position, he granted them only one vote. It is commonly believed that the cult of Tal and Raya were offered an electoral vote as well, but they refused to accept it for unexplained reasons. This uneven split of the votes managed to infuriate many of the cults, and the other electors for different reasons too. But Magnus ignored the complaints, for he had greater plans in mind. Aware that the cults had been the main reason for the original breakdown of the previous empire, Magnus would form a council that all the important cults of the empire had to attend to by imperial decree. This grand conclave, which is what Magnus called it, would take place every five years at the imperial capital, and would be chaired by the emperor himself and this would ensure that any significant problems were dealt with swiftly. Following his victory over chaos, Magnus also recognized the potential value of the School of Engineers to the Empire as a whole. And so he granted it the title of Imperial College of Engineers, or more fully, the Imperial College of Engineers and the Stefan Franz School of Mechanical Expertise. The school would become an officially recognized imperial establishment, in addition, the large number of foundries that the Reichland princes had constructed in Nuln at the time would become the Imperial Gunnery School. Probably worth mentioning that both the College of Engineers and the Gunnery School are important institutions of the Empire. And yes, they do have quite a lot of lore behind them, which maybe one day we'll actually cover. And that, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the famous and beloved Emperor, Magnus the Pious, for today. Unfortunately, he doesn't have as much lore as, say, Karl Franz, on which I did three videos, but without a doubt, he is one of the most extraordinary leaders that the Empire ever had. I wasn't able to find anything on his death or end of reign, unfortunately, so if any of you know about that section of his story, do feel free to enlighten the rest of us. As it is, I'm glad I finally got the time to make a video on this important Imperial character. It does seem to be quite rare to find leaders in Warhammer which are just flat out decent and competent. If you enjoyed this, consider leaving a like, share and subscribe. Thanks a lot for watching, and Sigmar's blessings be upon you.